if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. I am um, very aware that you can tell that my accent is not from these shores. I've actually been in America for exactly half of my life. I am 56, so I worked that out. I came here when I was 28. Um, I'm obviously a limey, um, but I consider myself to be um, also absolutely a European. Um, I was so fortunate to grow up in a Britain that uh, didn't have to go to war. I was fortunate to grow up in a Europe that was, for the most part, during most of my life, unified, in peace, and relatively prosperous. So when I think about Marshall, who I, is one of my all-time superheroes, I actually would go so far as to say he was the most influential American as a European of the 20th century. And I could give you several reasons for that. But when I think about the speech he made 75 years ago, um, which ushered in the golden age of European democracy and restoration, um, I'm ever more in awe of the many talents and the many geniuses of that great, great American. Um, so I'm very happy to be with you here, because I know that you guys also um, honor and celebrate him uh, with great reverence, which is what he's due. Anyway, I went to Oregon about four years ago, uh, BC, before COVID. And um, for some reason, I became absolutely fascinated with the 3rd Infantry Division. That's the blue and white stripes on their, their patch. And I went to see a gentleman in a retirement home in Eugene, Oregon. And he was called Bob Maxwell, a very, very religious guy. He told me that every day that he was in combat, when he was conscious, he would mumble prayers or he would pray openly. Prayed every morning, prayed every night. And uh, he received the Medal of Honor um, for actions in Besançon, in September 1944, where he muffled a grenade. He jumped on a grenade and saved other people's lives and was seriously injured. Actually very lucky to survive. Um, when I talked to him, he was using a breathing apparatus, apparatus and um, was very reluctant to bring out his medal. Uh, I managed to persuade his helper, my intermediary, to get him to bring out the medal. And uh, he put it around his neck, and he said, this, this has weighed very heavy on me. He was 98 years old. At the time, when I interviewed him, he was the oldest living Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. So I thought, wow, this is a great privilege, and it was a wonderful experience. But he pointed to the medal and said, it's weighed very heavy, because I didn't want to earn this. I never saw myself as being a public hero. Um, I certainly didn't want to be treated as a superhero. And for those of us who are privileged enough and honored, honored enough to have this around our necks, um, it's a very ambivalent feeling. I'm translating his long conversation. Um, because it reminds me of the worst day of my life and also the day where I was very proud to have done what I did. And he added that you have to remember that what I did was totally by instinct. I didn't make a choice. It was not an intellectual choice. It was not a moral choice. I saw a grenade bounce on chicken wire right beside me. And in a split second, I jumped on it. I am, I'm not a hero. It was just something that I instinctively did. Um, so I went to see him, and I was interviewed. I interviewed him at great length, and uh, he told me some beautiful stories about growing up in the Depression. And he'd grown up in a 
a very, very tough part of America to grow up in the Depression. That was in the, uh, in the plains um, during the Dust Bowl. And he told me that um, there was one day he would never forget um, when the, the storm was so great that he had to use a rope from the barn to the farmhouse to guide himself through the dust storm. He became a wire man, and he joked with me that the idea of following a rope wasn't too dissimilar to laying down wire and then following wire as you were being shelled in World War II. Very proud of his patch. He was a Marne man, that's the third ID. Uh, very distinguished history goes back to the First World War. They became famous for stopping, halting one of the last great German assaults aimed at Paris and forever more have been known as the Marne men. Um, they have the distinction, he told me, of receiving the most medals of honor in World War II. So there were some 470 Medal of Honor recipients in World War II. The majority were given posthumously. Most people who received that medal were dead. Um, when I interviewed Bob Maxwell, there were only four living recipients from World War II of the Medal of Honor. I was very lucky to interview all but one. Um, there is only one guy left alive in this country today who received the Medal of Honor, and that's Woody Williams for incredible actions on Iwo Jima. And he was, I think, 18 when he earned the medal. So it's a, a part of American history, a part of military history, and a part of European history that, in terms of the flesh and blood, is disappearing as I speak. Woody Williams, I hope he lives for a very long time, but when he passes away, there will no longer be any living American who received the highest award for valor from World War II out of those 470-odd. Um, so I thought to myself, what else? He, he, Bob Maxwell also talked about several other things that distinguished the third ID, the Marn men in World War II. They fought longest of any Americans in World War II in the European theater. They landed in North Africa in November 1942 and liberated Berchtesgaden. They went from North Africa, Sicily, southern Italy, up the jagged, bloody spine of Italy, Anzio, 15th of August 1944, Operation Dragoon. Many people don't realize that that's probably the most successful amphibious operation, certainly in the European theater. Then they followed the mighty Rhone, past those beautiful vineyards, they didn't get to drink any wine, and ended up in the Vosges in the mountains in November 1944. Um, they had tried to avoid General Truscott, who was uh, the, the most outstanding general of the 3rd Division, went from Sicily all the way to the Vosges with the 3rd ID. I believe one of the greatest and perhaps most, one of the most unheralded combat commanders of World War II, a wonderful character, Patton-esque in many ways. Uh, Melissa in the archives provided me with a, a wonderful photograph of him. Um, he had wanted to uh, avoid mountain warfare in the Vosges. He'd already spent a winter in Italy seeing the 3rd Division almost completely annihilated. From September until November 1943, the 3rd ID was in a war of attrition, taking one mountain after another that degraded it so badly that Truscott was worried that his entire division would be destroyed. Um, some of the guys that I write about in my book, Against All Odds, didn't go with a, without, didn't have a shower, were exposed to brutalization, deprivation, cold, rain, death of their comrades around them for one of the longest periods of time that Americans spent in continual combat in World War II, which was the fall to the November of 1943. And Truscott, above all, wanted to avoid another winter in the mountains. He didn't get his way. We didn't push far enough. Many others, you know, Patton, namely, after the great heady rush, the awesome rush of the summer of 1944, thought we'd be in Berlin, or at least we'd have ended this dirty, dirty game. 
instead we spent another winter trying to defeat Nazism. And the third ID lost an awful lot more men. Um, so they, they fought the furthest. It's a beautiful odyssey. It's a very long, bloody odyssey. First to fight, and they liberated, uh, symbolically, Berchtesgaden at the end. Um, that's not the 101st Airborne. If you watch Band of Brothers, you'd think it was the 101st Airborne, the Screaming Eagles, who we all know won World War II in Europe single-handedly. <laughs> um, in fact, the 101st Airborne, much as I greatly admire them, um, and don't take this the wrong way, every now and again, after a period of very intense combat, they would get to go back and eat a lovely English breakfast and date beautiful English girls who are, everyone knows are the most beautiful girls in the world, apart from Virginians. Um, but they spent, I think, around about 120 days actually in combat, 101st Airborne. A very important combat, but it pales into insignificance compared to the third ID, which was the longest, over 330. And I think the second longest was the 45th Infantry Division, um, who fought from Sicily all the way to Dachau. And I wrote a book quite a long time ago called The Liberator about one officer from that unit. So highest number of casualties, longest in combat, longest distance covered to liberate a place that I love and where I grew up. So fittingly, without repeating myself, when we talk about Marshall and what he did to Europe, how he helped prevent communism sweeping all across that beautiful continent, how he helped rebuild a place that, was, that had, had to be destroyed, how he gave Germany the potential through the Marshall Plan, how Europe was able to rebuild itself and the seeds of democracy flourished. I think people forget just how destitute, just how abysmal the conditions were in Europe after World War II. The war didn't end. There was a very hot, cold war that began actually before the war even ended. But certainly Europe, the fact that you can vote in Europe today, the fact that you can vote in Germany today, the fact that you can vote in this European United um, beautiful continent is because communism was defeated by, partly by the Marshall Plan, but by the restoration of democracy and prosperity in Europe after the war. And that had a lot to do with Marshall. So thank, godness, thank goodness there was a, uh, your greatest ever leader of men in war, I believe, the only guy that uh, Roosevelt apparently would call Sir in the Oval Office. He was never allowed to call him George. I think he made a mistake once. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Secretary of State, um, a wonderful diplomat, a visionary, very private, modest man. Uh, but I believe if it hadn't been for Marshall, marshalling those super egos in the Pacific and in the European theater, the war would have had a, a very, a much more, a less fluent outcome. There could have been a hell of a lot more problems. Um, so coming back to my original story, um, I won't go on too long because I'd love to answer a whole bunch of questions about World War II. But um, the four characters I write about, one um, is a guy called Morris Britt. Now, Morris Britt landed in uh, November 1942. He was from Arkansas. As with... Um, three of the four guys that I focus on came from a very tough, very poor background. His father died when he was young. That was the case with another guy that I write about called Keith Ware. His father died when he was young. Um, Audie Murphy's father, another character you've heard of Audie Murphy, his father abandoned his family when he was young. So one of the characteristics that the guys I write about that they all shared was a very impoverished, emotionally um, emotionally uh, lacking background for some of them. Um, either a father figure had, had, had died or wasn't, wasn't there, and they all had grown up being absolutely aware that they had to work every single second they could to support their families and to get through the Depression. They were extremely hardworking. Um, so I have 
Audie Murphy, You've, you probably know many of you about Audie Murphy. I follow him from Sicily all the way to the end of the war and beyond. Suffered terribly from PTSD, very badly from PTSD. And when you look at his combat record, which I did in, in great detail, um, you are struggling to reach for superlatives. Um, and I'm not exaggerating now. This is a, a, probably the, the finest soldier that I've ever come across. Um, incredibly violent, extremely lethal, and a fantastic shot, a great leader, and a great decision maker. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, I came across um, an eyewitness report when he was in uh, training and an eyewitness report when he was in combat in Italy. And when he was in training in not far from Naples before Operation Dragoon, an officer came along and saw Murphy in, uh, in practice, not actually in combat. And Murphy was able to run at a very, he was quite a small guy, very, very uh, slightly built. Um, in fact, his first company commander, one of my characters, took him off the line in Sicily because he said, I'm not going to have kids killed in my company. He was 18, he looked 14. Um, when you, if you look at the photographs of Murphy receiving the Medal of Honor in Salzburg on the 15th of June, 1945, he still looks like he's 15, 16. You know, he was 20 years old after almost two years of combat when he received the medal. But he would run, he could run, at, he could run very quickly at very low, very low on the ground and fire a carbine and hit a target 50 yards away perfectly. He was extraordinarily gifted at moving. Um, another example I came across, again, where you can't, there are no superlatives to describe exactly what this guy was like, his effect in combat. Um, he would move across the, the landscape and he didn't look human. A guy called Pyle, not Ernie Pyle, the poet laureate of World War II, Another guy called Private Pyle saw Murphy moving across a landscape on a, a scouting mission, and he said it didn't look human. It was like a feral hunting beast. This guy was absolutely possessed. So anyway, um, the most decorated soldier of World War II. Some people would argue the most decorated infantryman in US history. I don't want to get into that technical debate, but most people would agree, agree that he is the most decorated <coughs> infantryman of World War II. Um, the fact that he was able to function, the fact that he was able to come back after the war and star in over 30 Hollywood movies, including 1955's really good movie, To Hell and Back, which is the name of the movie, but also based on his autobiography that he wrote with a, another guy, but anyway. The fact that he wrote fantastic country and western songs, the fact that he still loved the military and would turn out whenever he was asked to. Um, the fact that he was 46 and still functioning uh, when he died in a plane crash, actually in Virginia, not far from Roanoke, to me was miraculous, given that I looked at what he'd suffered and what he'd been through. And I'd say that one of the things that I revered about the characters in my book um, and revere to this day about many of the people I've met from World War II is not only the indescribable resilience in combat, but the fact that they came back and were able to carry on. The, the so-called greatest generation, that's something of a marketing cliche, it's the name of a book. I think today's generation is, is great, every generation is great. They were just tested a lot more than others. Um, what made them great was not just their survival of the depression and their contribution to World War II, from my point of view as a, liber as a European, their liberation, their help in liberating Europe. 138,000 odd of them Americans died to liberate Europe. But it was how they came back then and then rebuilt built modern America. And I believe sincerely that the GI Bill was the greatest piece of social engineering in American history. It created the professional middle class and the America that they enjoyed in the 50s, 60s and Beyond was largely built from that social revolution and their hard work and the fact that they didn't put the war, war behind them. I don't think anybody I've interviewed from World War II ever put the war behind them. Um, if you go for over 200 days in combat, as Audie Murphy did, as Keith Ware, another of my characters did, you can never put the war behind you. 
you struggle every day to put it to your side and move on. So I think the, the medal meant an enormous amount to them, but to me, they were even more courageous in coping with the trauma that they'd been through, with the loss and the grief and the survivor's guilt that they all experienced. I mentioned a couple of other things and then I'll wrap up and you can ask me, you can throw grenades at me and ask me lots of questions about World War II. And without being too repetitive, I do apologize for not being able to show you beautiful pictures of these guys. Two people I haven't mentioned, apart, you know, Morris Britt, I mentioned him earlier, first American to receive in World War II every medal that you could receive. So that's the Bronze Star, Silver Star, DSC, the Medal of Honor. Um, he was in the third ID. He uh, um, was a Detroit Lion, played for the NFL, had his arm blown off at Anzio, never got to play professional football again, became lieutenant governor of, in Arkansas, um, and had a very, again, a very productive life. Keith Ware is one of my characters. He, I believe, is the only case in US history of a man who was drafted. He didn't belong to the National Guard. He wasn't a private. He wasn't in the military before the war. He's the only case that I believe that I, and you can fact check me, no one's corrected me yet, of a draftee rising to the rank of general officer. So he was in California as a pen pusher when Pearl Harbor was bombed, working for a catalog company. I believe he was 25 years old um, and ended up as a lieutenant colonel battalion commander at the end of the Second World War. It was decorated with five other guys from the Third ID in Nuremberg at the famous stadium. And I, if you can imagine the photograph that I was about to show you, it's a, it's a fantastic photograph because it shows you that's the largest number of five guys from one division decorated in one place on the battlefield in the European theater in World War II, and it was the 23rd of April, 1945. Five guys from the ID, including Keith Ware, who's wearing a really sexy pair of sunglasses, who's at the far end of the line. And if you remember Hitler making those amazing speeches, I actually watched some of those speeches recently, and I realized that he was absolutely raving mad. And the speeches didn't make really any sense at all. And when you, when you listen to them, What's so disturbing is that so many people would, would, even, would even listen to him. I mean, it's like opening the lunatic asylum and having the craziest guy come out and just rant at you. But anyway, Nuremberg's famous for those ranting, those ranting speeches, and that's where the five guys from the Third ID were lined up. It's where the Third ID ended up fighting their last big battle, the battle for Nuremberg, urban combat, snipers, the SS still want to kill you, only a couple of weeks from the end of the war. They'll go down and take as many Americans as they can. They can. And uh, fittingly, that's where the third ID, uh, they liberated uh, Nuremberg. And on the 23rd, they de in the Nuremberg Stadium, they decorated these guys. And then they, there was a huge swastika above the stadium. And uh, I found a source that said that as Keith Ware had the medal put around his neck, they blew up the swastika. And the Americans had used so much TNT that pieces of the swastika flew for 100 yards. And the chaplain way over here was uh, slightly injured by a piece of the concrete. Um, Michael Daly, the last person I'll talk about, Michael Daly, um, his father, he's one of the four. I'll talk about him lastly. He actually was one of the last Americans to receive the medal, um, to earn the medal, I should say, in the European theater for actions on the 17th of April in Nuremberg. Um, he came from a, a well-to-do Connecticut Irish Catholic family. Um, again, very religious. Uh, he uh, left West Point. I, you don't have to applaud. I know that that's a... a <laughs> um, thought that West Point was far too regimented and there was too much hazing. So God only knows what he would have done at VMI in the 19th... <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I actually went into, I came here about 10 years ago, and I went and looked at some of the, I think I spoke to some rats. They're called rats, aren't they? And um, someone said to me that because only two or three of the rats had fallen asleep, it was a great compliment because they'd just finished their initiation week. I don't know what that's called, but apparently sometimes half of them are just slumped there after this, uh, this ordeal. 
And I was shown some of their quarters, and I thought, oh my god, I, this is medieval, you know? Um, so uh, Michael Daly didn't like West Point. Um, his father was a highly decorated veteran of World War I, served in the European theater in World War II as a regimental commander, very good friend of Alexander Patch, 7th Army commander, one of my favorite American army commanders. Um, and uh, threw his books in the corner one day, said, I'm done with this, there's a war on. Became a private, um, to Sayonara to West Point, and his first day of combat was Omaha Beach, 6th of June, 1944, 18th Infantry, came ashore at one o'clock in the afternoon around about still being fired at. People forget that people were being fired at by snipers the next day on Omaha Beach. Fought through Normandy, wounded near Arkin, and then um, sent back to England because his father was very well connected, knew Alexander Patch, they were good friends, as I said. Sent him to Patch's headquarters in the Vosges. Um, Patch wanted him to be his aide. He, he drove Patch around for, for a while, had dinner with Patton, who he said swore very you know, enormously uh, at dinner, which surprises me, actually, because um, I, Patton was not quite, the, uh, not quite as rough and ragged as people imagine. Um, and uh, said to Patch, you know, Patch said, you, you know, stay with me, be my driver. He was a very bad driver. Um, they almost got in a very bad accident because Michael Daly would put his foot on the pedal too hard. Um, and at uh, age just 20, um, was given his wish and ended up in the 15th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd ID just in time to see some of the bitterest fighting in the Colmar pocket. So he's finally my last character. Um, six foot three, uh, company commander at age 20, 20 years old, received, earned the Medal of Honor, 17th of April, 1945, having fought all the way from Omaha Beach to the heart of Nuremberg. And um, in the last days of the war, in many days that he fought, the last days of the war, he, um, he had reached a place where he was beyond life, I believe. I, I genuinely don't think that he was worried about dying. Um, he certainly was worried about young boys, and they can only be described as boys dying under his command. Um, he later said, obviously he survived, just. He later said that the greatest honor of, of his entire life, something that he would never feel again, was the pride in leading 200 young Americans in combat to liberate Europe. And he also said that it was a time when he saw the real America. He'd never seen a more diverse group of Americans from all over this country with one cause, whether some of them believed it or not, fighting together from different backgrounds, different accents, all united under his command. He never saw that again in his lifetime. Never experienced that unity common purpose. Um, and as the war wound down, many people were very worried that they could see the light at the, the door was cracked over there, and they could see the light streaming through finally. Finally, they could taste hope that they might not die. Because you have to remember that most of these infantrymen, they knew that it was highly unlikely that they would go home in one piece. They'd either be lucky enough to get a million dollar wound, and I've come across cases where guys were laughing when they had their arms blown off, because it meant they would live. They were happy. So they knew they would get a million dollar wound, or they would be killed. And if you look at the statistics, and you look at the third ID, and you look at the 45th, and you look at um, other divisions, that was the fact, that was the case. The turnover was atrocious. We were in a war of attrition, and the longer the war went on, the more industrially savage it became in the Pacific and in Europe. People forget that in January of 1945, over 20,000 young Americans were killed in the European theater. That's January 1945. It's not June, July of 1944, during Normandy. It's January 1945. And the attrition becomes even scarier when you look at the Pacific. When you're looking at Okinawa, Iwo Jima, it becomes terrifying. And when you're looking at invading mainland Japan, there's a reason why people thought dropping the bomb was a very good idea. 
And Michael Daly, like many other officers, um, wanted to keep as many guys alive under his command as he could. He could see the light there. He didn't, I believe, didn't care whether he got to walk through that door. But he wanted the guys that under his command, as many as possible, to get there, to have a chance. So in Nuremberg, the last big battle that the Third ID were involved in in Europe, symbolic, the heart, dark heart of Nazism, <coughs> greatest evil apart from communism of our time, of the 20th century anyway, um, there was very fierce fighting. Um, and Michael Daly earned the Medal of Honor on the uh, 17th of April for taking out four or five machine gun nests single-handedly by being the point of the spear, going ahead of his company, doing what others should have been doing. He's a company commander. He shouldn't be there. He, did, he was there. And um, people, a couple of eyewitness reports described his actions that day as being, they were awestruck. Often when witnesses see guys earn the Medal of Honor, they are sometimes dumbfounded, they're awestruck. There's something supernatural about how lucky they are to live, given what they do. Um, didn't sleep the night before, didn't sleep the next night, and then found himself at the medieval wall surrounding the heart of Nuremberg the next day. I stood up on a pile of rubble. I've been to the spot where he, where he did that. I've traced his footsteps. I traced the footsteps of, of all four guys. I went to Sicily, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and I stood where he looked over a medieval wall and was shot by a sniper. Bang! And uh, was shot through the face. So he was shot from here, through here, through his palate, collapsed on the ground, and um, started to bleed out, coughing up blood, choking up blood, and lay there and took a pencil out of his jacket pocket, combat jacket pocket and stuck the pencil down his throat and performed basically a primitive kind of tracheotomy and saved his own life. Um, operated on, uh, was given last rites, people didn't give him any chance, thankfully survived. Um, he um, came back to the US, um, he received the Medal of Honor from Truman on the 23rd of August 1945 at uh, the White House. It was the largest number of Medal of Honor recipients ever gathered in the White House. I think there were 28 recipients. A couple of them were in wheelchairs. And um, he was still just 20 years old. Um, and there's a photograph I found that had been colorized and um, metal, Truman puts the medal around his neck. And you can see that Daly, maybe it was the flash of the photograph, but his eyes are closed and he's standing like this as if it's, as if it's a kind of benediction. A very, very devout uh, Roman Catholic um, who did pray an awful lot just to, during the war. It was, a, it was a, a beautiful moment. Came back to Connecticut, uh, open top car. His father was beside him. And he later said that he wished it had been his father that had received the Medal of Honor, not him. It was the only medal that his father hadn't received in World War I. Um, but in saying that, what he was saying was that he didn't, he didn't want that weight. He didn't want to be a public hero. Like many guys, he just wanted to come home and try and recover. And it took him a while to try and adapt to America. Um, it's hard to express the sense of dislocation that GIs felt both from the Pacific Theater and in Europe, coming back to what was, compared to Europe, um, certainly a very prosperous country. Wages went up very significantly during World War II. If you had a job, your lifestyle was significantly better. Um, prosperity was, uh, could be seen everywhere compared to Europe, which was starving. Um, and most Americans had no idea unless they'd been in combat. And let's not forget that of the 16 million Americans that served in the military in World War II, very, very few saw the, saw the sharp end. Very few. Uh, they were behind the lines. They weren't seeing people being killed around them, and they weren't having to kill. 
They weren't having to become a different kind of human being that takes other people's lives and has to live with that. Um, so when Michael Daly came back, when all those guys came back from Europe that had seen combat, when they came back from the, in some, in some ways, even more hellish ordeal of, of merciless war in the Pacific, where very few prisoners were taken, where the barbarity was, was extreme to, to get to victory, they came back to America that, that where no one really understood where I would argue that no one understood except for the people that they had experienced that barbarism with, that deg degradation with, that, that brutalization with. Michael Daly um, drank quite heavily. A lot of those guys did. Um, it's a myth that they didn't come back and become alcoholics and die at early ages and beat their wives and have very miserable, traumatic lives. We just didn't read about it. We didn't have a culture of therapy. We didn't have the term PTSD, and uh, amazingly, so many didn't do that, and as I said before, were able to put the war to the side. Daly was a bit of a heavy drinker, um, drifted for a while, and then finally uh, became a successful businessman, but said that he always was looking for a cause, something that he could believe in, that would animate his soul, and his life as much as what he's experienced in, as an American in a uniform with a third ID, blue and white striped patch on his shoulder. Emaciated because of stress, because he was losing a pound every day from combat stress. Um, uh, he never found, he was looking for that sense of purpose and a cause, as he said, that was greater than himself because he believed that in World War II, what he did and what so many others did was a cause that was absolutely, in the, for the only time in their lives, something that was far greater than themselves. I think when you look at, I've read many accounts of, of veterans looking back on their experiences many years later, talking about World War II, and they feel incredibly honored to have been there, to have experienced the most exciting moments, the most important moments, some of them said, of their entire lives, apart from bringing up their families, having kids, etc. But they felt incredibly honored to have been part of that history. Um, but they also often said, I never found anything that felt as exciting or that made me feel as proud as that. Um, Daly finally found a cause that he thought was greater than himself. Not as great as the one in World War II, but it was helping other people, helping veterans. And I don't want to sound remotely corny now, because I'm not. It was something that gave him an immense sense of satisfaction. And he said that you know, the thing that he learned was that you have to have something that is bigger than yourself. Your ego will never make you happy. You have to serve others. You have to, the, the path to, to him and to satisfaction, to contentment, to being at peace with himself was absolutely about service to others. And so he spent a lot, a lot of time going to veterans' funerals in Connecticut. And uh, he, um, when he died, I was lucky enough to interview his daughter, um, it was a who is a formidable woman. And uh, he was given last rites. And uh, he saluted his priest. And um, he said that. Um, the world didn't need more men like him, warriors. Didn't need more Audie Murphys. Didn't need more Keith Wares. Didn't need any more Medal of Honor, men, men that could earn the Medal of Honor. And I thought to myself, what do you mean? We need these people all the time. What's happening in the Ukraine reminds us that we need these people all the time. That when we turn off, when the Europeans have turned off, when they've not remembered history, such recent history which would even if you read the most basic account of the Russians in World War II, you know what they do. You know what they did at Stalingrad, you know what they did in Grozny, you know. Of course we need, VMI produces them, other places, we need warriors with great courage to win battles, to win us wars. That's the whole point of the Medal of Honor. But Daly believed at the end, and he said to his priest, we need more peacemakers. 
we need men who will make peace. And that's from a guy that had given everything to lead Americans to victory in World War II. I will end by saying this. Um, the one characteristic that I was convinced they all had in common um, was uh, total selflessness. And I think that that's something that um, not just Medal of Honor recipients have in common, but people who serve in a situation where they could lose their life. When they put their lives on the line, they, they a lot of the time are doing it because of the people around them, because they, they want to save the lives of the people around them. They want to be there to protect those people. And every guy that I wrote, wrote about that earned the Medal of Honor, they were utterly selfless. The actions they performed were about getting a job done because they thought they could do it best. That they should do it now, otherwise a lot of people would be killed. Guys they were leading would be killed. That's the case with Keith Ware. That's the case with Morris Britt. That was the case with Audie Murphy. And that was the case with Michael Daly and many other Medal of Honor recipients. They are in a very, very, very faithful situation. They, someone has to do something. Someone has to act. They do it. They act. And one of the reasons why the Medal of Honor is earned and is later recognized as being so important is because often, often it's the case that a lot of American lives are saved by those actions. Over and over again, I came across situations where so many men had been saved by the actions of just one man at a critical point in a certain battle. Anyway, I wish that I had some beautiful images to show you. I have literally just stood here and talked off the top of my head for way too long. Um, I thank you so much for being a really fantastic audience. And if I can answer any questions, I'd love to. Thank you for, thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just for a matter of reference, uh, as far as the EPA is concerned, are there any DC members left in World War II? I don't think there's any living uh, Victoria Cross recipient from World War II. We were very stingy giving out Victoria Crosses. Um, that's not a comparative statement, by the way. Um, we only had one recipient for uh, all of D-Day, a guy called Stanley Hollis, who came on uh, came ashore at um, Gold Beach. I wrote about him. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of historians and Brits have always said, you know, to, to only give one medal for D-Day, whether you had, I think, some over 70,000 Brits in, in combat. Um, I think there were, and you can, I, 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 this, is, this is me trying to remember, I think there were five American obviously Americans, Medal of Honor recipients for D-Day. Um, and, uh, you know, um, when you look at Omaha Beach, for example, uh, over 900 killed on June the 6th. Um, uh, three Medal of Honor recipients for actions at, at uh, Omaha. Um, but there were, I, when I was researching the Medal of Honor and, uh, and June the 6th in Omaha, I came across cases where they had downgraded recommendations for the Medal of Honor to guys that landed in the 29th and the first ID to DSCs. Um, and I found this to be outrageous, but the argument at the time, certainly um, in July 1944, was that if they gave out too many medals for actions on Omaha Beach, for, you know, for God's sake, that it would somehow downgrade the value of the medal, of the Medal of Honor, which to me is ludicrous, but that's a long-winded way, long way of answering your questions. Uh, very stingy with the Victoria Cross. And I think that there are, certainly when it comes to D-Day, um, a lot more medals should have been given out. Uh, yep? You mentioned with Michael Daly that his father had served during World War I. Had uh, any of the other veterans he interviewed or recipients of uh, the medal had relatives who fought either in World War I or maybe even as far back as Civil War and they might have played a, a role in their motivation? Or uh, actually, no. With, with where? 
um, apart from Daly with Ware and Murphy and Britt, there was no, certainly no relative that was in World War I. I I'm not sure about the Civil War, the Revolutionary War. Obviously, there must have been some connection, but um, Daly was the only uh, guy that, uh, whose father had actually served with distinction and actually been in World War I. And Daly's father was wounded, I think, in December of 1944 um, by mortar fragments. Actually, it was the same weapon that had, had uh, injured Daly in September of 1944. So they were both injured by mortar shrapnel and was sent back to the US and was, was really annoyed, very, very angry that he couldn't carry on in combat in Europe. Um, but he, was, he just couldn't. He was too badly wounded. Yeah. Uh, where is uh, Where is Grave? Is uh, at Arlington, yeah. and and Murphy's is also. Yeah. No, no, he's not. He's not buried in Arlington. He's buried in Connecticut. No, he's not buried in Arlington. No, no, in, he's buried in Connecticut. Um, uh, where is an interesting character because uh, he he um, went on to. He was the only, of the, only one of the four that carried on in the military and was killed in Ca Cambodia in 1968. Um, so I think he was 53 years old, um, became the commander of the Big Red One, and we weren't really supposed to be in Cambodia publicly in 1968, but we were. And he was doing the same thing he'd done in World War II, which was to be at the front and to visit his men and to find out what was really going on. And his helicopter was shot down. Um, so he, I visited his, his grave at Arlington last, not this, last May. Um, and it's not too far from, from Audie Murphy. Uh, they, were, they were pretty, they were in good, they communicated after the war. Where was Audie Murphy's company commander, B Company commander in Sicily on the 10th of July, 1943? Where was the guy that had said to Murphy, yeah, I'm not killing kids, you're out of the line? Uh, Murphy insisted on being put back there and uh, Ware said, okay, if you want it, you can get it, and he did. Uh, and so Ware, as he rose up the ranks, he was always in a position, he was the uh, commanding officer of the, of the company and then became the battalion commander that uh, Murphy always served beneath him. Um, and they were together, they were able to meet at the end of the war and um, actually Ware was uh, teaching at West Point while Murphy was making uh, starring in uh, To Hell and Back, the 1955 film, and Murphy asked Ware to be the technical advisor. And Ware said, sorry, I'm, I've got a job teaching at, at West Point. Sorry, I can't, I can't advise you on the movie. But um, they stayed in touch. And when Ware was killed in Cambodia in 1968, Murphy was very upset by that because he'd seen Ware as something of a father figure. He'd been through from Sicily all the way to the end of the war. They'd, in, they'd stayed in touch after the war, had been in communication, and um, he was, he took it, apparently took it pretty hard. You know, this was a, a connection to a part of his life that um, was very dear to him. Do you have one, one more question? Uh, there's one occasion that I came across where he refused, it was in early 1945, I think it was March 1945, where um, he refused uh, a Battle of Hill Commission. And the reason why he refused was because he didn't want to, lose, didn't want to leave uh, his company. He was still in B Company. So 10th of July, 1943, B Company. I've been to the beach where he landed in southern Sicily. He was still with B Company in March of 1945. So he'd fought all the way through Italy, Anzio, you name it, through the Vosges, Colmar Pocket. Um, and didn't want to leave B Company. It was his family. It really was. Probably closer than his own family in some ways. Um, eventually, they persuaded him. There's a scene in my book where they persuaded him to take, uh, to become a, a second lieutenant. And they, they twisted the rules. He didn't have to be posted out of, out of B Company. He became, he, he could stay in as a platoon commander in B Company. Uh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Was you, when you were uh, made an officer, when you were promoted, you were supposed to move to a different unit. And they made an exception for Murphy because he was an exceptional soldier and didn't last very long. I think the, um, 
I think he learned just a couple of weeks later that he was about he was being, that he'd been recommended for the medal, and uh, after that they took him off the line. He became a liaison for um, the unit uh, because people didn't we didn't want guys like Audie Murphy, who in receiving the uh, the Medal of Honor became would become the most decorated soldier of World War II. We didn't want people like that dead. We wanted them as a live heroes. And uh, Murphy became the poster boy for the GI in World War II. His face, his photograph was on the cover of Life magazine in July 1945. You know, baby face, very handsome Audie Murphy on the front of Life magazine. Jimmy Cagney in Hollywood picks up Life magazine, sees this very handsome young boy, um, boy soldier on the front cover of Life magazine. And Cagney contacted Audie Murphy and said, come out to Hollywood and I'll make you a movie star. Um, and he put, put him in his, his, fake, you know, his guest cottage in, in Hollywood, paid for acting lessons, paid for him to go to a gym, and uh, basically began his Hollywood career, started him off in Hollywood, um, all from looking at his picture on the front of Life magazine. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned Jimmy Stewart. I was actually at the airfield last June um, that Stewart uh, flew from. And if you look at the pictures of Stewart before he went into... Um, Stewart's 8th Air Force, isn't he? Yeah, 8th Air Force. Uh, when you look at the pictures of him before he went and served, um, I think he did over 30 missions. And then you look at the pictures when he came home, and I mean, that, that, that guy went it, it aged by... It looks like... Two decades. It's incredible. Um, and then the, the beautiful Christmas movie, um, you know, there's a story about how the fact that actually that was him dealing with his own PTSD, that he identified with that character um, so profoundly, the, the trauma, the loss, that actually some of those scenes were not him really acting. It was his, him, his experiences from World War II coming back. Um, I think the... the the, the thing that I couldn't get over when I was in East Anglia was the fact that, that East Anglia was basically American in, towards the end of World War II. There were so many bases. And the level of attrition, the fact that in early 1943, if you'd arrived as an American in England, you had a one in four chance of being alive by the end of 1943 in the 8th Air Force. You know, the bloody hundredth, the, the, the attrition rate, the loss rate was just extraordinary that you'd wake up every morning knowing that you probably sort of very good chance of being killed that day and that units would go for a couple of months and everybody would be dead you know just uh, it's extraordinary the nerve um, and the fact that the, dis the, the disassociation of going um, leaving bucolic England Beautiful, beautiful places in England, flying above where I grew up and then going into hell and then trying to survive and then coming back. Now, how, how disjointing that must have been. You know, maybe at least someone like Audie Murphy and Infantryman, they were in a period where they, would, they didn't have to be jolted out of hell. They, they weren't made aware every day of the beauty of life, of... of of, of what they would lose, you know? One little story, I, um, there was so much drinking, I mean, us Brits are pretty good at that, but um, you, you can imagine being in the 8th Air Force in East Anglia, lots of really good English pubs, and there were enormous stress that people like Jimmy Stewart that aged him, uh, not knowing if you were gonna be alive tomorrow, um, they drank a lot. Uh, but most of the pilots uh, didn't have access to vehicles for, you know, they, they would have crashed them. They didn't have, they couldn't. So they, all, they had a standard issue bicycle. And when I, I went to a museum and, um, for the bloody hundredth and uh, they showed me a bicycle. And um, 
there was a problem with the bicycle, the design of the bicycle. The handlebars were somewhat too close to the, the saddle. So unless you were fairly small, there was a problem with your knees banging into the, the handlebars. And there were some times when there were more pilots and air crew in the hospital from having crashed their bikes when they were drunk <laughs> on the way back from the pub than there were from actually <laughs> missions. <laughs> that was, I don't know whether that story is apocryphal, but it, a guy, a, a British guy told me that, so maybe it is. <laughs> I have, yep, thank you. One, one final question. Yeah, one. A uh, very good question because, very good question because, um, you know, he is in the movie reliving scenes that were incredibly traumatic, including losing his best friend, Lattie Tipton. It's a famous scene in the movie. I've actually been to the vineyard where it happened because that day, the 15th of August, 1944, first day of Operation Dragoon. Uh, they landed in Saint-Tropez. So during my research, I was like, oh, we've got to go to Saint-Tropez. You know? uh, and it is a gorgeous beach. Um, and it was, it was gorgeous then, too, except that there was some amount of bullets being fired. Not too many, but enough. And um, I, went, I moved inland. It's about th three or four miles inland. And it was sometime in the early afternoon, I think, that um, Latty Tipton, who had been with Audie Murphy from... Um, Italy all the way through. Um, two Germans appeared with white flags. Um, they were apparently surrendering. Audie Murphy said, you know, stay down, don't go near him, it's a trick. Lady Tipton didn't listen and was shot and was killed in front of Murphy. And Murphy went on a rampage. So people saying that, you know, you look at the nice happy cowboy movies, I would have been scared to death if I was a German, if Audie Murphy was even a mile from me. I, that guy could kill quickly and viciously and didn't, didn't take, not, I didn't come across too many cases where he took prisoners. So he killed the guys that had killed Lattie Tipton and um, I went to the spot where a guy that opened the gates for me, I was waiting for about an hour for this, this Renault van to turn up and I went to the vineyard and it was beautiful and um, that was the only time that Audie Murphy was seen to cry in World War II as he you know, knelt over Lattie Tipton's body. And Lattie Tipton is the most visited grave in the Draguignan American Cemetery in, uh, in Provence. Everybody wants to go and see where, Lattie, where Audie Murphy's best mate, was, best friend was killed. Um, but to actually, in not even 10 years after the war, to re-film to those scenes where you're playing yourself, losing your uh, best friend must have been very difficult. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to star in the film. The, the producers persuaded him and um, certainly didn't want to have a scene at the end of the movie where he was shown receiving the Medal of Honor. He said, that, that, that's, no, I don't want that. But how could you make a movie called To Hell and Back about Audie Murphy who received the Medal of Honor without showing that scene? It's very important. The producers finally persuaded him to, to actually to be in it. Um, he made, also made Red, Red Badger Courage, which you may have seen, the John Huston movie. It was actually a really good movie. And John Huston said that when he first met Audie Murphy and started talking to him, that Murphy was quite disturbing, that there was something a little bit lacking. Um, and by lacking, he meant that there was this, like, an ability to be really excited by anything. And Murphy said, you know, um, it's really hard to get really, really excited by anything after you've been through the amount of excitement that I had. I mean, he took about overload of adrenaline, you know? Um, so that's why he was a pretty heavy gambler, because that was something that got him fairly excited. You know? Okay, that was the last question. Can I, can I again thank you for being such a wonderful audience? Thank you.